Greetings. We begin with this question. <clears throat> when will Jerusalem be overthrown? Got it up here. When Jerusalem is crushed. Right? Now, Jesus gives us future event knowledge. Some people call it prophecy, but let's call it future event knowledge. So we can rejoice at his power and majesty for having known and written it in Scripture long before it actually comes to pass. In Luke 21, 28, Jesus speaking, Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, get excited, because your redemption draws near. Redemption, what's that? That means you're about to enter the kingdom of God if you've been a faithful servant of Jesus Christ. So back to our question. When is Jerusalem overthrown? Many expect Iran and Arab nations to attack Israel in the near future. Jesus shows us that that attack will be totally defeated. Yes, as much as there are many, many Arab nations who are against Israel, that attack gets defeated. We're going to see that in Scripture. Before we look at that total defeat, we need to picture Jerusalem's two great wars that are ahead. Now, I call them the final war and the freedom war. Those are the two wars we're going to look at here just briefly. Let us focus on the final war first, because that's where most people focus. Most see this as the Antichrist war. This war leaves Israelite soldiers in captivity. Yes, they're mighty warriors, but when it comes down to this final war, Israel gets defeated. Israel's soldiers are either killed or in captivity. We see it in Luke 21, 20. But when you see Jerusalem, says Jesus, surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. It's going to be destroyed. There's going to be a war like you can't believe, and it's going to wreck the place. Verse 21, Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Get out of the city. Get out of the countryside. Get up into the mountains where people are not going to mess with you because you're a tiny little group of people that they don't really care much about. Verse 23, But there will be great distress in the land of Israel and wrath upon this people, the people of Jerusalem. Verse 24, and they will fall by the edge of the sword. Old language for die in battle. <clears throat> edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled <clears throat> by Gentiles <clears throat> until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. We find out in other scriptures that that's three and a half years. <clears throat> before, excuse me, before this final Jerusalem war comes, the hidden war, most no one is talking about. And I call it the hidden freedom war to <clears throat> remind us that it's, most people are not even aware of it. Most people don't think about it. Most people are not talking about it. But it's right there in Scripture and we need to pay attention to it. <clears throat> Daniel eleven forty one, He shall go and enter, shall also enter the glorious land. He who, <clears throat> if you read the context, it's he, king of the north, the first of three in the sequence. He, king of the north, number one, shall <clears throat> enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. Now we have to take this very slowly because this great mighty king <clears throat> enters the glorious land, that's a code word for Israel. He enters Israel, and in the same verse, and many, not Israel, Israel's the first part of the, of the verse, and many, many other countries shall be overthrown. It doesn't say many countries will be overthrown, and Israel too. It says he enters the glorious land, and right now, glorious land Israel is surrounded by nations who want to see its destruction. And many nations, many countries will be overthrown, totally invaded, totally captured, but these shall escape from his hand. It says Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon, if you look at old Bible maps, Jordan is not included. So he enters Israel, which is getting ready to be attacked. Uh, once, once they settle the 
the great war in the Middle East, the sort of civil war between warring factions, once they get that out of the way, they're going to come looking for Israel. And he enters the glorious land. At the same time, he captures, he invades, he overthrows many nations, but not Jordan, which makes sense because Jordan has worked hard to be an ally of the United States and of Israel. Verse 42, he, the king of the north, one of the first of the three, shall stretch out his hand against the countries, in verse, the verse before that, many countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. So Egypt is included in the many countries. And he shall pa have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt. He's going to totally conquer and own their wealth. And then it says also the Libyans and the Ethiopians. Well, the Libyans, uh, there's essentially no government in Libya now. It's, it's just invading and warring tribes and, and it's just chaos down there. And so you can see there's three Middle Eastern nations that are named as part of the many nations that are captured and overthrown. And Jordan, i.e. the old names for the Jordan area, they're not captured. They're not invaded. So Jerusalem is being protected from a great attack from many sides as it's had many, many attacks in the past. This war leaves Israel free of its mortal enemies who is defeated these these mortal enemies are now defeated and they're in captivity so this they call this the freedom war for israel so we have two totally different wars for jerusalem with two totally different outcomes this freedom war leaves israel as a functioning nation able to be taxed by a higher power. Now, do I, do I say that? Well, in Daniel 11, 20, and Jesus said, take note of what Daniel says the, in the prophet, there shall arise in his place one who imposes taxes. Okay, in his place is the second king in the sequence. And he becomes, he's the second world leader in this sequence. And he imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom, code word for Israel in the Bible. But within a few days, he shall be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle. So he comes on the scene, he has a plan to start taxing Israel and other countries probably, but he is destroyed. So our second world leader is now out of the running and he's replaced by a third world leader. Now, verse 20, we just read, is the second in a sequence of three world leaders. And we see these three kings of the north when we read verses 19, 20, and 21. Daniel 11, 19, 20, and 21. If you read them in, together in sequence, you see this sequence. Verse 19, Then he shall turn his face towards the fortress of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Now, who's that? Well, he's the first one in this sequence. Verse 20, there shall arise in his place, the verse 19 guy, in his place comes number two, is one who imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom. But we're told he is destroyed. Then verse 21, and in his place, in number two's place, after he's destroyed, comes number three. In his place shall arise a vile person <clears throat> and seize the kingdom by intrigue. Now don't think just king, kingdom, little country. Think world leadership. These three leaders <clears throat> have great power and world leadership as their sequences play out. This third king in the sequence is seen as the final war king that crushes Israel. Ten verses after we see him come on the scene, he is making Jerusalem desolate. Down in verse 31 of Daniel 11, just ten verses later, and forces shall be mustered <clears throat> by him, and they shall take away the daily sacrifices. Now, if you pay much attention to what's happening down in Israel, they have been preparing everything that's needed to begin morning and evening sacrifices. And they have tried to set up a, a cornerstone and wanted to for a long time, and they've been denied and, and blocked by the government because the government knows 
if they allow that to happen, the Muslims in a great circle around Israel will go berserk and they'll start a war immediately because they're invading the Temple Mount where the mosque, the Islamic mosque is seated right now. So the daily sacrifices he takes away and he places there the abomination of desolation or the abomination that makes desolate, which is the key and the trigger Jesus told people, if you happen to be in Israel, if you happen to be in Jerusalem, at the time of the abomination of desolation, if you're not sure what that is, take the other half of the verse, and it's the time the daily sacrifices are stopped, because it's the same day. He stops the daily sacrifices by replacing those with this abomination of desolation. In the New Testament, we're told, <clears throat> Paul says, this great vile person sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He is such a powerful, charismatic leader, and he shows himself that he's God, and his, and his helper, the false prophet, calls down fire from heaven and impresses people to where, not knowing the scriptures, they accept him as the great one, and he is the abomination who sits in the temple who will make Jerusalem desolate. So, the giant elephant in the room here is when is Israel able to be taxed? Is it before or after the Freedom War? Or is it before or after the final war? Okay, so I've got here taxed after the Freedom War. Because after the final war, they are in total captivity and you don't tax people who are in captivity. It's like Hitler's death camps in World War II. They hardly fed them anything. They hardly had any strength to do anything. They did a few little jobs, maybe, but most of them were just prisoners. And, and you don't tax people who are in death camps. So it's not after that war. Then it must be after this first war, the Freedom War. And then comes world leader number two, king of the north number two, who wants to tax the glorious people. Right? So after vile king number three crushes Israel, they're in captivity. They can't be taxed. If the second king in the sequence taxes Israel, it must be after the freedom war. And it's led by, you know, the freedom war is led by the first king in the sequence, and when he's taken out of the way, comes the second king, who is the tax guy. He's the guy who wants to tax people. And they've been talking for many, many years up in the United Nations, if you've been following it. They've been talking about having a personal tax on every person in every nation around the world to, to have, the own person, they have their own funding for the United Nations. Right now, the United Nations is funded by donations from the countries of the world. America gives a huge donation to help keep the United Nations going, but they want to have a personal tax. So here's the second world leader. He comes on the scene after the first one's out of the way, after the Freedom War is over, after Israel's enemies are defeated and captured. And now, that's why I call it the Freedom War. And now the second guy comes on the scene and he decides this would be a good time to tax the Israeli people who are still a nation, they're still viable, they're still working, they're still productive. So Jerusalem has a freedom from its enemies war and then it's taxed by the next world leader and then it is crushed and overthrown by the third world leader known as the Antichrist. 